Um, we apologize for the abrupt transition. There's a little bit longer in the How much is left in the documentary if people want to keep watching An it? An Another hour. hour. Um, no one told me we were cutting it off at that point, so I was boohooing in the corner over there, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, I think I just felt every human emotion that one could possibly feel uh, during those 30 minutes. Um, obviously, we're, I think we're all moved by this. Well, when you started putting this documentary together, obviously you had been filming for a long time. Did you have a goal in mind? Um, like the first thing, uh, in 2016, right after we left uh, Syria, Aleppo, after the displacement, uh, I was just like so desperate and so disappointed about everything happened. And I was like, I'm not gonna do anything anymore and all of this archive will just like stay Maybe when I will be like 50, you know, I will do that film and for my daughters or my granddaughters. But then I felt like, no, this is need to be something now. And instead of being like desperate and disappointed, I should be like angry and make this anger like being transformed as a mm -hmm. film. And the first thing was just like how we can tell the story in the best way as we felt it and as we witnessed it because Right after we left, so many Western journalists and even governments, they were speaking about they did the great job of saving the people of Aleppo. And they were so, the UN specifically, they were so proud about the displacement and they called it evacuation. And for us, you know, it was like this is a, a, like an, another crime happened to us. Mm. Instead of they make ceasefire and make us like in our country safe, they decided to force us to flee out and implement the Russian and the Syrian regime uh, plan. And I felt, you know, like this is what we need to tell them our point of view, our perspective about what happened. Uh, and yes, we are lucky that we went out and we are safe, but this is not something we wanted to do. Right. There was the, the point where we ended the documentary, it was just showing um, the little boy that passed away and his brothers were, were there and they were saying, that's my brother, and then the mother saw him. And um, it, were there points like that? Were there ever points where you thought, you know what, I just can't film this anymore? It's too hard. Yeah, like the, this, you know, there's two uh, perspectives in this every time. They were struggling into my mind about, you know, like what the point of filming this? Maybe this will not change anything. And this is so hard, specifically that I, so many times when I have some, but the other point was, you know, like the only thing I can do for these people is to film mm -hmm. and maybe tomorrow all of us will be killed. So this is really need to be saved and need to be sent out so people can really see that. Mm -hmm. This like three brothers story specifically, I was, Sama was in the first floor in our room and I was downstairs. And literally as I was filming this, I was just crying and thinking about, I can't do anything for them now, a part of filming. I need now to focus on film and also like film in very professional way and get like so amazing scenes because even the news we have another challenge that for the news and all the challenge outside if the quality of the picture wasn't good if the story wasn't like perfect no one will care to release this story out yeah. so you know we need also like not just think about what we are thinking but also how this people outside will look at this story and really use it so it's just, you know, so hard, so difficult, but at the same time, so important. So the, the title of the film is For Sama, and it's obviously for your daughter, and, and I think you have two daughters now. Yeah. Um, what are you hoping when they're, when they're old enough to watch this, what do you hope that they get from this? So like my, our main fear, I would say that this story will be told not as we've seen it. Like, I don't know how many years from now and from even before, they will say that what happened in Syria, and they're still using this frame so many places, like civil war. And for us, it's revolution. It's better future for us, for our children. It's for Sama, for Taima, for all the children in Syria who was born after the revolution. And they should know how we proud, you know, of that, and how we proud that we are Syrians. I, I don't know when they will watch it, but I really hope to for them to understand why we took that des decision and whatever that price of everything like the Syrian people sacrificed during this years. I hope when they will watch it and when they will grow up, they will be in Syria, not like as a refugee in any place all over the world. Dr. Hamza, how do you, 
How do you operate in these environments as a medical professional? I mean, the amount of, uh, when we watched you throughout the scenes, um, you were so steady the, the whole time. H how does one operate in this environment? It was so difficult, of course, and there's a lot of, uh, like, frustrated moments okay. uh, when you feel like you're not only trying to, to save lives in the worst of, like, conditions, when, like, lack of resources, lack of medications, lack of human resources, but also when the hospital is, like, clear target for the Russian and the Syrian aircraft, when you know that every time, at any moment, this place could be destroyed and lay in any like decision that any doctor need to take to like to admit a patient that he's responsible for the safety of this patient also not only to treat him and uh, the only thing that like the health system basically that we were representing the health system all the doctors and the hospitals in Aleppo and in Syria represented the health system there we need to show like uh, like we know what we're doing and like we are exactly like calm down like in order not to freak the the patients and like increase their their suffering what i just want to to add on the previous mm -hmm. uh question about like it's like when when this film when, when Wad was making like editing the film with with edward the main point was just like to tell the story we had no idea that we will witness the same suffering again and again and again in al-ghuta then in Dara, and now in idlib That's right. and also, when like the, the, the Russian and the Syrian propaganda managed to shift the narrative of the Syrian revolution to make it all about terrorism, Al-Qaeda, refugee crisis, no one was like, like thinking about, like, if you were, and of course, all of you were following the media in 2011, 2012, all the narrative was about the Syrian revolution, the peaceful demonstration against the dictator. But then, 2000, like, when, basically, when the Russian info, like 2014, 15, 16, Till the moment, it's all about ISIS, mm -hmm. refugee crisis, and no one is talking anymore about the dictatorship that is ruling the, the, the country at the moment and like managing to control over 80% of it, which is like the main reason why everything started in 2011 in Syria. Well, my friend, we are talking about it here, and we're going to continue to talk about it, and we're going to give you the voice um, now. now f and uh, as long as Dave Shanker and I have any control here, we'll keep talking about it. Edward, how did you get involved in all of this? Um, <laughs> we've answered, we've yeah. been asked that question a few times. Um, the short answer is that from the very beginning when the Syrian revolution began, I felt that there was something that was relevant to us all that was happening there. Because what you saw was people like Wad and Hamza, middle class, secular people who shared our values, who were peacefully protesting in the spirit of Martin Luther King or Gandhi, and being met by a level of mechanized state violence that I don't think we've seen since the Second World War. And there was something elemental going on for humanity in that struggle. And that's why I felt we needed to stand with these guys right from the beginning because I think one of the problems was that people viewed Syria through the prisms of Iraq and Libya and those conflicts that have preceded it and they didn't recognize that there was something fundamentally different about what was happening in Syria. You know in my country in Britain we have Bloody Sunday which is like a stain on our national conscience when I think troops killed 13 protesters in the 70s. We were seeing like 10 Bloody Sundays every week and I was amazed to see that the Syrian people continued to hold to their principles of peaceful protest. Now, that cannot happen in the world. You know, to paraphrase, paraphrase Martin Luther King, if there is an injustice like that happening somewhere in the world, it's happening everywhere. And if you'll forgive me, because it's not often that we'll all get to talk, but I'm a historian. Uh, I studied at Oxford. And just the thing I would love all of you to reflect on is a particular theory of mine, which is that Syria is very similar to the Spanish Civil War, which occurred in the 1930s. And it was the, it was the, it presaged the bigger conflict to come. Because there, as here, the majority who embodied democratic principles were trying to, trying to get democracy, and in, they were met by a minority that had the, the, the monopoly on military force. And again, outside forces came in. In that case, it was Hitler's Germany. In this case, it's Russia, in order to crush that democratic principle. And the democracies of the world, the natural allies of the people who were fighting for democracy, we wrung our hands and we did nothing. And because of that, because the fascist powers were emboldened in that way, 
it allowed much worse things to come. And I believe that's what's happening now. You know, we talk about our international system is in pieces. It's in pieces. It's shattered by Syria and by our failure to stand with these guys from the beginning. And I know, we know right now how hard it is to see what we can do to help people who are suffering in Idlib now. But we have to use all our great brains and all our energy to think of something. Because I do believe it's not too late to do something to help. Because if the regime win, if the Russians win, if the revolution is finally snuffed out, then we are going to have worse to come. You know, you, you mentioned our great brains working on this. One of the reasons Jim Jeffrey isn't here is because he flew to Turkey to work um, on this situation as well in, in Idlib. And um, it's amazing whenever the news gets really bad in Syria and I get depressed about it, Jim Jeffrey is the one person who always is the one cheering me up and giving me the message and saying this is how we can soldier forward. But that, that feeling of hope is something that I found so beautifully weaved throughout your documentary. You know, you see some incredibly soul-crushing moments, and then the two of you, whenever you were dancing your first dance at your wedding, I was just grinning ear to ear, uh, watching that sitting in my seat, because it was just such a, a beautiful moment of how you can have hope in the, in the midst of everything that was going on. Given what we're seeing in Idlib today, Wad, how do you have hope for Syria? You said you didn't want your daughters to go back or to be refugees. Excuse me, you said you didn't want your daughters to be refugees. You want them to go back and be Syrians. What gives you hope? I will say, like, the first thing is our belief that the Syrian revolution was something so important to happen. And we still, like, feel that in every Syrian. We've met, like, there's so many Syrians here tonight, today. And there's still, like, people who are still in Idlib now. This field defense people who still, like, every day going towards any attack happened. They knew that there could be like uh, double attacks and they could be killed. Even with that, they are going to rescue so many people every day. The doctors who still un until now in so many hospitals inside Syria, they knew that the hospital itself is an, like a target, but they're still working in that place. Uh, the teachers who still to find any place to do, you know, like a small groups of children to anything to give them and you see that one exam example uh, uh, in the film about a woman called Afra who she ran the hospital in the basement and you know like every person who's still like finding hope while he's still inside it like, for these people we shouldn't like leave that hope we should still catch that and still find any if we didn't find hope like create that hope through anything to do just to keep our fight all for the people who's still there Hamza, um, as a Syrian, you hear people throughout the world when they're talking about Syria, that they make the argument that Assad should just stay in power, that we should work towards elections, that we should just work towards a political reconciliation with Assad, that we should just give up. How do you answer that? It's just make me like very, I think the right word is angry, because obviously like those people had no idea what's going on in Syria. and. I can't like believe that any uh, like democratic country in the West can't have any relation. I can't imagine how they can have any relationship with a war criminal, and it's like I, I hope that we get to a day that when the Assad war crimes, it's not just a point of like uh, like a matter of point of view. Was it happened? Who happened? What happened? To reach a day that when it's like the the Holocaust, that anyone who denies them will be. Uh, like judged by everyone in the in the Western country that no this has happened and we we need to stand for out for for the victims. One of the other things that we really like also it was since also 2011 when a lot of people in the Western were asking the question like who should come after Al Assad and like you have election you are democrat countries you know that it, it's the system who protect the country not the person and. Like that's not a matter of like, who's coming next to have like an election, and if the other president wasn't good enough, we'll have another election, and mm -hmm. another person. Will, it's just like yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. But I don't know why it's very complicated in Syria <laughs> to just have this simple yeah. thing. It's a timely yeah. message for us during the middle of our election. Sorry. Did you have something to say? No, I mean, it's the same like when they ask like who's alternative. Like there's 22 million Syrian. Anyone of them could be alternative. They, he's not like you know a very. I, don't I think Wahad would be a good president. Yeah. 
I don't think I'm supposed to take sides as a State Department spokesperson, but Edward, maybe we can start a campaign for a while. <laughs> no, like I want to be a president, yeah, just to do one it. day. Yeah. I'll do running. one day and then I will like uh, resign. It's fine, you know, it's okay. <laughs> I've been running that campaign for months, but the first person we need to persuade is WAD herself. <laughs> well, We're on so that. Edward, do, do you guys have any new projects coming up? What's next? Uh, well, the big thing is we've launched this impact campaign because one of the things I think that has given us hope through this process, when we were working together for the two years, everyone said, oh, no one cares about Syria, you know, maybe the film will be shown in one festival and then disappear. But instead of that, it has really you know, capture the imaginations of audiences from Mexico to Kosovo. We're opening in, well, we opened in Korea, we're opening in Japan, we're opening in Germany, that's all still to come. And at the end of every screening when people, and I hope you guys get to watch the full film because, you know, the full experience is different even from the 30 minutes. Everyone is always like, what can we do? You know, and so we've set up this impact campaign to try and answer that question for just ordinary people. We're wearing these badges saying "Stop bombing hospitals." So not how for do you. People find out about not the impact campaign. Here. Yeah. It's not for the people here. Yeah. It's no. for normal people. Normal people. people. <laughs> but these people here can do a lot of things by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so it's called actionforsummer. Actionforsummer. Yeah. Dot com. But you can okay. Get your Everybody got help. that. Actionforsummer. Dot com. Yeah. And is it on Twitter? It's on Twitter. Action for summer. That's the social handle everywhere Wonderful. and um, yeah please just do whatever you can to spread the word about the film people can watch it on Amazon Prime now you know the more that people can see the film and see the truth of what happened in Syria the more that people will be engaged to help what I want to give you the final word oh my god I will give the final word for the people who are here because really we felt so abandoned through nine years and we feel that we are sharing with the people here in the USA or in so many other countries, the same dream of just being, having like better life for us and for our children, for the future. We really like hope to have, especially this place where we feel that really most of the big decisions all over the world being taken in this place and by people like you. So I really hope that after this, it will be a real things of stop bombing the civilians in Syria. Uh, I don't know, like there's so many things everyone here can do, but also the, the point about this story didn't finish three years ago. This is still happening and we are just the lucky people. Don't look about us, look where we came from and look about the other 3.5 million civilians who still like, uh, literally as we're speaking now, it's now night time in Syria. So many people in the street and they're like uh, Olive Street or and they're, even now the camp became like a dream for so many Syrians. We hope really we can really change that. Hamza, just like the, the situation at the moment, and you, you might know better, but just like to, to highlight, like since April till December, the, the Russian has attacked, has launched 71 airstrike attack on 51 health facility, mm -hmm. destroyed, the, destroyed like more than 40 health facility completely. 10 of them were maternity hospitals. So the situation is worse than before. And I'm sorry to say this, but the situation that we are now in Syria, it's not like, of course, the fault of anyone, but the, the, the series of mistakes <coughs> from the U.S. previous administrative, till, like, until till the moment, the lack of action towards Syria uh, has led to this situation. But it's never too late. And like, yes, now we're out of Aleppo, displaced. Lghouta people are displaced. Dara people are displaced. But there are still people in Syria who wish to live in a country in a freedom country, in dignity, in a democratic country, without al-Assad, without the terrorist, it's not too much to ask. So it's never too late. Well, um, it is an enormous, privi enormous privilege for me to, to interview all of you, to show your story here at the State Department. And you have a lot of people, like General Jack Keane, Mike Pregent, Danny Pletka from AEI, and others who have been telling your story for a long time and they're going to, to leave here and help us at the State Department continue um, to tell your story. So I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be a tiny, tiny piece, a part of it. And thank you, uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much.